This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Simon Lelevelt, a regulatory consultant for payments and blockchain. Simon discusses his response to the FinCEN cryptocurrency surveillance ruling, his overall take on the current status of cryptocurrency, thoughts on getting people to use something that preserves their privacy in the technology itself, unlike Bitcoin, and how the regulatory battle and relationship between government and regulators will shake out. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Simon, thanks for coming on Monero Talk. Well, happy to be here. Thank you. So, yeah, you're, where are you calling from? Where are you? Uh, I'm in New York. All right, so I'm in Amsterdam uh, in a for uh, in, a, in a attic somewhere in an apartment. And you know the books. It's like the uh, yeah, uh, way up in the attic. Daddy has his uh, lockdown office. That sort of. Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, obviously a lot of financial history over there in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, that's that fair to say? books. Yeah, definitely. So so Amsterdam by definition has a lot of financial history, and I uh, enjoy sharing this. Uh, uh, in, in the in the non-corona season, I would do tours in Amsterdam, uh, explaining the financial history of Amsterdam to visitors and telling how them uh, how it all came about. So, uh, and uh, just a tiny bit of that history is behind me. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So I came across you on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I think you were recently making some comments related to privacy coins or privacy yeah. aspects of, of cryptocurrency. And I started to take a, de- a more of a deep dive into you, looking at your tweets. And yeah, so I realize you are are quite the expert. Uh, you've been looking at crypto, it looks like, since at least 2011, and actually actively writing about it. And then it sounds like, in addition to that, you've ju- you're an expert just in the field of financial history itself and banking. Um, is is that your day job? Is that what your expertise is in? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm basically a business engineer with a uh, with an ICT um, MBA combination, and I started out in 1990 uh, doing research on electronic funds transfers at the point of sale and how they were regulated. So I stuck in the area of regulation of financial innovations ever since 1990, uh, ever since the early days of eCash uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, working at the central bank at the moment in time that eCash came about and there was a lot of stuff to do. So I'm sort of, if you look at electronic money, eCash, or what, what we now call stable coins, I've been there like a dinosaur in the early days in the 1990s, being uh, involved in, in both the development and the regulation and supervision of it. So, uh, so were you one of these guys that was kind of thinking about Bitcoin before Bitcoin existed, thinking yeah, about yeah. it as an idea, as a thing that it would be nice to have if somebody can invent it? What, yeah, what was your... Yeah, 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 indeed. So so what I did in, uh, in the 1990s is um, make a comparison of the legal framework of Europe and the US, uh, basically to uh, lay out the importance of using a functional framework. And so I, I said, well, you, you've got sort of different forms and shapes of payment instruments. And if you make a table, then the right bottom cor- corner of the table would be empty. And that was a uh, technology emptiness because there wasn't sufficient technology to have a peer-to-peer uh, uh, crowdsourced. But I mean, you didn't have the bandwidth or the uh, data storage capacity that we had afterwards on the internet and with clouds, uh, uh, cloud uh, processing. So the, the concept of, of doing, doing peer-to-peer stuff in the cloud was, uh, in theory, it was there, but it was like, ah, yeah, no, never. We still have these modems <laughs> like this. So, so that was the empty part of the table. And, um, well, uh, it, it has been filled because technology made a step forward. So, yeah. And then also there, there was obviously the breakthrough in, in solving the Byzantine generals problem is often how it's yep. described. Yeah. Is, so is that something you were kind of following in real time? When, when you came across Bitcoin, did you realize at that time that it had solved these problems, that it had essentially created decentralized uh, digital cash? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, so so I was uh, sort of um, uh, I got this information from uh, from Ian Grigg, who was living in Amsterdam in the 1990s as well, uh, and he had developed his own uh, PGP-based uh, smart contract system. Uh, so so we were toying around with the internet, thinking about what happened. Financial cryptography conferences were there, and all that stuff. Um, uh, and and he said, eh, "Have a look at Bitcoin." So I had a look at it from from uh, well historic perspective or crypto perspective. So I wrote down, well, yeah, well, mm, uh, okay. So mm, it's never going to work as a payment system, but uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. So everyone was on my on my neck, like, well, how can you say this? And then I was at a conference early on in London, saying, well, you know, it doesn't have a power base. This is 2012, or think or so. I think it doesn't have a power base. So. I'm sorry, but it's not going to fly, and we have a monetary problem as well. So there are, it's not going to be a, a full mass scale uh, retail payment system such as Visa or Mastercard. That was sort of my my analysis for for some reasons. And then people all jumped at me and they said, "Well, listen, listen. If you listen to me closely, I am saying the exact same thing about the euro itself, because the euro, by its design, with these European countries trying to hold each other together and some arguing and fighting and." And, and UK wanting to be in and out has the same power problem. So don't get me wrong for for saying Bitcoin is not go, is gonna not gonna fly. I have the same long term perspective on the on the euro as a payment mechanism, because if you really uh, look down structurally towards power structures and, and um, uh, currencies in societies, uh, it's about the, the the power base. So where's the power base? And you can see that the power base for Bitcoin actually has improved quite a lot because it's so robust and and functioning for many many years. So so I think I would have to revisit uh, my statement. So I over last year somewhere I I, I published a, a statement where I said, well, okay, I think it's now time that we consider it a public open good, a public good. Uh, you can use it in many many ways. Don't just coin it or phrase it as a tool for currency or store of value. Take a more wider perspective. Understand that this is an open source technology with a wide variety of usage and a huge benefit for everyone in society. Um, so I got I got on a learning curve somehow, let's say. Yeah, so, so you, it sounds like you started off like a, a healthy skeptic of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which which is understandable, especially considering your background. And it seems like you've now uh, evolved and um, continue to, to study it. And you're now more accepting of crypto. Uh, yeah, definitely, you're... definitely. And, and, and what I think is very important is that we look through uh, and we discard all these simple money laundering frames that are being thrown at us. I mean, I'm, all the things you say about Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency being used for money laundering. I mean, it's 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 even worse within the banking sector with the money laundering. So. Uh, these are really political frames, and that that was, a, I think, a part of my, um, yeah, part of the reason why I figured now that the FinCEN was coming with this Christmas present <laughs> of theirs, let's throw in some of the political and history background on on regulation uh, and on the importance of privacy and how we all got sucked into this cult of money laundering evasion stuff, where the only thing we see is crypto criminals and money launderers. Where effectively the reality is completely different. So, right, it's a little bit like focusing on you know the early looking at the early days of the internet and just focusing on what it could potentially be used for in a, in a nefarious way versus looking at all the good it could possibly provide. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like uh, uh, waking up for breakfast, um, uh, doing your bread, and deciding on peanut butter, and looking at your knife, and, and, and thinking only thinking about who am I going to kill rather than. <laughs> Is it going to be peanut butter or jam? I mean, I don't know. But you're not looking at the knife thinking about who am I going to kill? You're going to use it for what you want to use it. It's not It's not about knives for, for killing. It's it's a tool. So so we, we tend to do with crypto is, is like only see the, the knife as a murder tool. And that's, do you, that's do you think uh, there's a conscious reason why uh, people are choosing to see it that way? Yeah, uh, definitely. Particularly yeah. regulators? Yeah, yeah. There's there's um there's a very good dissertation by a Dutch scientist, uh, Mara Wesseling, and she has uh, looked at the shift in the regulatory debate. And actually, around the 1999, I think in the US, there was a huge debate on increasing the surveillance rules in the financial sector, like putting in the travel rule, putting in the customer's information into payment messages. And it was sort of like this this Vincent rule that we had last Christmas, but but then on on a uh, on a wider national scale, and ev everyone. 
filled the, the, the mailboxes of the regulators saying this is an invasion of privacy, we shouldn't do it. And, and it was sort of brushed away uh, by, by Congress like, well, what a stupid idea. We're never going to put all those personal data within payment messages and stuff like that. So it was, it was kicked out immediately as a completely wrong way to approach uh, sol uh, solving issues of money laundering. But then you had the 9-11 attack. And then within two weeks, the whole frame had shifted. And, and the whole, uh, the whole idea of using administrative law, not, you can use penal law to catch through uh, crooks. You don't have to use financial supervision law to catch thieves. I mean, yeah, you can do it, but it's, there's no need to. But this frame has been entered after the, in the, in, in the wake of the, um, the 9 11 attack. And it's a very important political shift. And, and from that moment on, already 20 years, all banks and financial institutions are sending, uh, private information of people all around the world. And the reason for it is because it's easier for a police officer when he's in the other territory that he doesn't have to phone up the Netherlands and say, hey, tell me who, who's sending this payment. He can just look in the message that has arrived in, in, in the US and say, ah, yeah, that's Simon from Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, I know him. So, so there's this, this broadcasting of private data, uh, specifically chosen as a tool to, well, you could say, uh, avoid money laundering or terrorist financing. But there are economic reasons uh, why why it could be useful for governments to have all this information within payment messages. So, uh, yeah, we 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 were framed into this um, in, into this privacy invasion many years ago, and and now we have a generation of people who think it's normal that 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 we throw and we broadcast all private information of customers within payment messages. It's stupid. It's still a stupid idea, but we've <laughs> we've uh, yeah. So uh, how do you, how do you see it shaking out? I mean, a lot of people in the you know in the crypto community, especially like the true you know the cypherpunks, uh, the diehards, would say, uh, you know, the technology is winning, uh, and essentially we're winning on that front. It's it's hard it's hard to beat crypto. It's hard to stop cryptocurrency, protect, particularly ones like Monero that has fungibility built into the protocol level and essentially privacy. But on the regulatory front, there's there's going to be a battle there and they're, they're going to try to potentially stop crypto. Do you think that's going to happen? And how do you see it shaking out? Well, I, I, I tend to sort of compare it with um, uh, the early days of the internet where you would have... Um, uh, I, I would share basically my CDs and put them online and, and, and exchange it with other people. You had peer-to-peer -peer service. So I got this huge database of music and the music industry and regulators hadn't come around to, to sort of closing the gaps on, on digital rights management stuff and all that. So there was a window of opportunity to use the, all the possibilities of peer-to-peer -peer technology. And then slowly um, the uh, you see the criminalization of stuff that regulators don't like. You see um, sort of offers uh, being offered to the public, like, well, you can now go to the iTunes or Spotify and you can download and it's all legal. Uh, so, so if you criminalize on the one hand the technology and offer uh, a legal uh, perspective, which works as well, then most customers won't care and they don't want a hassle of being in the, in the dark territory or the criminal territory. So you see people shifting from the available technology solutions towards the uh, sort of legal technology solutions. And that might create a wedge between uh, between what's possible, but then uh, unduly criminalized versus uh, the, the reality of, of mass public adopting the, the simple procedures, the simple stuff that looks legal, doesn't give a hassle, and, and you don't end up uh, possibly with your account being struck because you're doing stuff with illegal uh, data or content. So, so that my, my feeling is that that might be uh, what we're looking at. So what would that look like in crypto? Well, in crypto, it, it would translate into um, basically the, the um, Financial Action Task Force on Fraud. This is the international collection of ministries of finance that are basically crushing down on, uh, on uh, every kind of financial instrument. Basically, they say we need to monitor it. We know who you are, transaction monitoring stuff. This is the, the, the privacy invasion uh, cult of, of tax officers who want to basically collect taxes. Um, and they will be continuing to send out guidelines like we need additional controls, we need this, we need that. And there is a self-enforcement mechanism because the FATF is an international organization and every couple of years 
a group visits a country, then they give them a scorecard like, well, you're doing good or you're not doing good. But if you're low in the scorecard, you end up being blocked out of the financial system. So you have an incentive as a country to, to apply all these money laundering measures and be in line with the, their regulations. Uh, and this is a hugely effective mechanism to push all countries towards more regulation and to criminalize stuff which is forbidden. So if, if you succeed in, in accepting a rule at the international level that uh, self-hosted wallets uh, should should have, um, uh, we should do the same with self-hosted wallet as, as with payments. If, if you do a transaction from A to B, then uh, the, the payment information and the beneficiary information should be in there. If, if you start applying those banking rules onto the, the wallet ecosystem of, of cryptocurrency, yeah, it's, it's completely silly. But if the FATF is doing it, and they are doing it, then uh, that becomes a tool in the hands of local regulators. Then they will say, well, if you don't organize your system in a certain way, then we're going to not give you a license. We, we're gonna, not going to allow you to operate in the market, or we're going to send you to uh, to the judge or whatever. So so there's the structure, it's the International Regulators Forum. They push it down to the local level, and at the local level, they will enforce it because once every three years or four years, a group of FATF people will come down and give you a scorecard and you want to score high because otherwise uh, you risk being out of the game. So do you see that? Uh, so we saw FinCEN propose these rules yep. recently. Yep. Uh, and now I guess it's been delayed with the new administration yep. coming in. How do you see that playing out? Do you think those rules will get passed as proposed? Yeah, that, that's very hard to tell. So so we could all have very sort of like, uh, certainly from this side of the ocean, it's, it's completely impossible, of course, to, to have the same sensitivity to the regulatory landscape uh, um, as, as I have here in the in the European context. So, uh, Well, I guess give us the, the European version first, what's going on, and in particularly in Netherlands, right? Because I think they're even more aggressive over there right now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's right. So, so I was... <laughs> So I would say to you guys in the US, you're lucky. They did a consultation period. Good for you. <laughs> so everyone's sort of shouting like, well, we only got two weeks for, for, for comment. Well, listen up to the Dutch story. The Dutch story is the following. Um, uh, we have a European regulation that says all crypto business needs to have a reg registration. And that basically signifies it's not like a license or stuff. It's, it's basically showing you you're good in anti-money laundering stuff and you're off the hook. You can go about continuing your business. So each country in Europe has to implement this and countries take a different approach. Now the Dutch have chosen a very fierce approach where they sort of say, well, yeah, well, if money is being sent to a, a wallet of a customer itself, then he needs to demonstrate ownership of the cost uh, of the wallet before he can take it from any crypto broker so there's an additional verification requirement uh, completely the same like vincent but without the threshold so if you buy a pizza for five euro and you want to buy virtual assets or bitcoin to to get the pizza you need to go about you 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 need to onboard with all the stuff and then if you want to move it to your wallet you got to demonstrate that the wallet is yours and this doesn't uh, so they want a screenshot of your wallet Okay, so there are like a zillion ways to fake a screenshot of a wallet. It doesn't make any sense. But somehow the central bank feels uh, that this rule does uh, very much. It's, it's, it's so important to them that they basically say, if you don't apply this technical rule, you're not going to get a registration and you're out of business. Goodbye and good luck. So and, and they didn't consult the market. Uh, as the FinCEN did, they just uh, suddenly came out with this idea and said, yeah, well, it's of course, it's clear. Everyone should know that this is common sense. Well, it's not common sense. There's like 25 companies registering in the Netherlands. They all wrote a letter to the central bank saying, where did you come up with this? This, 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 this isn't in our law. Like seven lawyer companies writing collectively on that letter saying, doesn't make sense. Where does it come from? Well, it doesn't matter. The central bank says we're going to push it in. And if you complained, or if you're if you're gonna say you don't like it, then we're gonna delay the registration process, so you're out of business anyway. So feel free, you're you're completely free to choose and apply the measures you wish. So in a full sense of uh, Amsterdam liberty and freedom, there's the complete freedom to do exactly what the central bank does, or otherwise you're out of business. And that's we. So we got the harsh version of the FinCEN rule without thresholds uh, to be implemented uh, right away, or otherwise you're out of business. And that's what's happening here. And so I, I know I keep trying to 
pretty much I'm asking you to predict the future, which is obviously a hard thing to do, but how do you see that playing out? That seems extremely strict. Do you think that's going to be um, ratcheted back? Uh, uh, the- no, well, it's definitely not going to be taken back by the regulators themselves, but there are uh, some players um, uh, going for the administrative courts, um, and one player has announced that they will they will be fighting this in, in court. So, so my suggestion, I, I think, unfortunately, in this area, we are, yeah, we are the, um, the front runners. And I guess you, you may want to watch the Dutch space because I think there's been already the announcement, uh, that there's going to be litigation on this matter. So exactly what Coinbase announced in the US, uh, like if, if the FinCEN rule is going to be valid from the 20th of January, then we're going to litigate immediately against it. I think, uh, I, I noticed some sort of statement like that in, 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 in the US, uh, circumstances. Well, over here, uh, one of the companies has said, well, we, we, we've we been force-fed this re- registration requirement and we're going we're gonna to fight it in court. So I expect we'll, we'll see something of that coming up. So once again, I mean, you've been looking at crypto since the early days, since 2011. You've been uh, a healthy skeptic of it. So... What if you you know if you were king of the world so to speak or you know you had the ability to decide what direction things went in terms of regulation what would you want to see uh, how would what type of environment would you want to see for crypto how, how do you think the relationship between crypto and governments regulators what that what do you see that relationship being in the most ideal form. Yeah, so for for the ideal relation between uh, crypto and the state, I think I would draw on the ideas of uh, Phil Zimmerman. Um, uh, and he says, um, you need to have a private space and you need to guard the private space of all individuals. And I think, it, as I understand it, it means basically you need to allow people to do criminal things in their own private space if they want to. You need to create a society where things can be private. And the reason for that... Uh, is the, the, the compelling reason and argument, in my view, is that the, the government can change. Your government can change into a bad government, which does evil. And in that case, the good guys need the privacy. So you want to give the criminals in a good situation with a good government, you want to gr- give the gr- criminals or people who do bad, you want to give them their own space to do all the stuff they want. You need to make a robust society, which can, uh, through other means rather than surveillance, also monitor and ensure that society is, is behaving or is, is, is in an orderly fashion, working in orderly fashion. Uh, and the, the over, over the big need for data surveillance and, and communication stuff and all that stuff within payment messages, for example, is, is there's no need to. You need to create societies which are robust enough and give, uh, allow people this personal freedom. And that's, that's the fundamental relation. If you don't, um, he said, at one point in time, you'll get a bad government who then knows everything about you. And, and like the worst case that, that can happen is, is if you take a dystopian view, there would be a government issuing a central bank currency instead of cash. And then starting to tweak the buttons of the central bank currency, like, well, okay, it's going to rust a little. So, so we're going to make it, we want people to spend money. So we're going to chip off something of the digital currency each day automatically, uh, so that you're quick to spend it. Or we're going to say, no, it's only accepted at, uh, you can only buy it at this company or you can only use it over there. If you, if you create tools that, that are too influential, that are too, um, intrusive, uh, and do not allow for the fundamental liberty to, uh, communicate freely, to transact freely, um, and then you're entering a dangerous territory. So we need to preserve that space very, uh, uh carefully. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, you know, I see that as being, uh, you know, an American philosophy, what this co- America was built upon. Uh, and I, I'm particularly passionate about that. And, you know, that's why I, I, I became a Monero guy. I feel like that that truly aligns with those ideals of preserving people's liberty, uh, especially as we enter into the digital age, uh, essentially encoding the ability for people to be for people's liberties to be protected, rather than uh, relying on the state to provide provide those protections, it becomes encoded in this technology that we all use. Um, and I think that was kind of the promise of Bitcoin. And I'd love to hear your opinion there. 
since you, you once again since you've been studying it for so long what do you think of the fact that bitcoin is essentially at the end of the day a transparent ledger that the whole world can view and see uh you know that that states can can look at that corporations can look at and obviously those with more money and more resources can use this tool to potentially surveil and censor if if need be you yeah, have an yeah, yeah, yeah there, well i i think um it's important to look at the the blockchain technology and bitcoin uh, blockchain in particular uh, as a sort of an open source technology with many features and many goals and objectives so there are many use cases uh, possible uh, and each of the angles angles that you named are are possible angles and you can say well this is good or is it bad well, the good thing is there, it's out there and everyone can use it. So if I'm, if I'm in Venezuela and my currency is terrible, but I have a nephew in the US and I can communicate with him and I can save, save my money or I can, I can put my resources towards him or send it to him or he sends me Bitcoin and I can convert. I can basically jump under, uh, uh out of my bad government who, who does a bad job in preserving the monetary value of the local currency by using an alternate system and that those kind of use cases are very uh, valuable and you see like a one-on-one -on -one relation between governments that have have a bad legal state a bad a bad justice system and a bad monetary system those are the, the governments that forbid bitcoin because bitcoin is your insur insurance premium against these governments that try to to push you into their into their rules and being able to to jump out of the rules of your government is, is a very important democratic feature um, of the bitcoin blockchain uh, but there are many, many other possible use cases. Um, I mean, if you dream up a use case and you have a couple of friends, you can just say, well, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna share our house and we're gonna divide our house in five items and we're gonna transact this, put this in a message on the blockchain and everyone can see that this happened. Or there's so many ways. It's like a huge digital notary system that's available for everyone against a, a lower fee than your regular lawyer. So. So there are many, you can use it as an indicator. You can say, well, the Bitcoin price is a sort of a proxy to a major economic developments, uh, or it's a front runner to what will happen with the FinTech industry, or it's a democratic, for example, in the Netherlands, if you want to uh, invest in securities, you have to do this, this mini test, whether you're capable of understanding what a share or a security is and all that stuff. So bottom line, the, 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 the people, who haven't done their, their PhD degrees and all that stuff, they can't jump through the hoop. So they can't buy stock and shares on, on, on the exchange because they're, they're not smart enough uh, in, in the views of our government, but they can just buy a Bitcoin. And of course they, they need to understand it's risky, but if you're sort of regulating the world into a situation where, where you, you need to get driver's license for everything you do, including buying shares, shares on a stock exchange, I understand we need to be careful for people. But I, I also think we need to allow people to do things if we just warn them properly beforehand. Do you know what you're doing? Do you know your money is going to be gone? Are you really sure? And then, and then get, let them off the hook. Let them, yeah, let them be foolish. I mean, don't be too, too, um, uh, protectionist. And, and Bitcoin is, is like the, the entry into it. It allows people to, uh, insure themselves against the monetary policies of, of the governments right now. And why would you limit it? Why would you? It's an open technology, and that's a very useful, useful tool. So I see many use cases, many important features, and it is a, a an open infrastructure. Basically, you could even say that that the whole uh, the biggest compliment for for the Bitcoin infrastructure is that that uh, Facebook, when it tried to rule the world with their own Facebook coin, basically emulated the business model of Bitcoin. They said, well, we are blockchain. No, they're not. But they said we are blockchain. And they did sort of like the Satoshi Nakamoto trick by setting up this Libra organization in Switzerland and then saying, no, no, it's not us. It's a different organization. We have nothing to do with it. It's like disappearing as a founder of, a, of an international payment system. I mean, it's it's sort of the biggest compliment that that's Facebook modeled themselves after Bitcoin uh, to, to, well, push forward for the hegemony of the world. That's something uh, completely different. but. Uh, it does. It's, it does say um, that that the idea of having an open network, an open source technology network, with a lot of use cases, is is very strong idea and very useful for society. Are you concerned 
that because of Bitcoin's transparent ledger, that the technology will be co-opted by powerful entities like the state. And essentially, it won't fulfill its promise of becoming digital cash. There's, there's this definitely. There's this risk. It's, uh, it's also like, like the when, uh, in when the internet emerged, there were these nice visions about true democratic societies, and you end up with a bunch of big techs controlling platforms over the world that that basically push you around and and and, and almost make you into a marionette, moving on their uh, uh, whims, sort of. Um, so I, I see the 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 promise. I see the risk that it turns into something that it should not be. Um, and I also believe that there will be a, a countervailing moment. Like right now, you see this, these uh, anti-big tech law, law proposals come all, uh, coming up in, in the US as well. At some point in time, there's going to be a, a, a counter power. That's, that's my hope, I think. Or, or, or I would say it's, it's the ine inevitable flow of history. But yeah, that's, I'm, I'm not certain about that. The, the, the other thing is the there is a you could say there's a good idea to to try and make it less transparent and, and create a, an additional layer of privacy onto this kind of networks because of those effects that you mentioned there there are good reasons to to argue for that but then if you come to the Netherlands we have the central bank again and they basically said well you want to do crypto stuff you want to have your license okay kick out all your privacy coins. So they started already by by basically demanding that if, if you're into the crypto business, you don't offer privacy privacy coins to your customers. So I'm I'm uh, I'm concerned that this uh, right, and, and this is exactly what you know. This is really the, the root of what I want to get at in this you know in this conversation um, is the fact that you know Bitcoin. It, it does seem like it's being co-opted in a way and that it, it's being welcomed by, by governments and by regulators because I think they, they are realizing that it isn't a threat. And I'm not saying, you know, threats are good, uh, but for all those reasons we we're talking about, this idea that we need to make sure people's liberties are protected, that people can transact freely, uh, you know, this philosophical idea of protecting minorities and minority opinions and minority ideas. And if, you know, we have, uh, if we live in a world where, where anything can potentially be censored, uh, that becomes very dangerous and can lead to tyrannical outcomes. And what we're seeing with Bitcoin is that it's starting to be welcomed because there's this realization uh, that it's perfectly transparent and there's technology there uh, where the blockchain can be scanned and analyzed by people with enough resources and that things like pr privacy coins, the ones that actually are more disruptive are the ones that are, are potentially going to be regulated out of existence or at least there's going to be an attempt there to do that. So do you see, is that, do you think that's what's happening? Is that, is that what's going on behind the scenes? Is well, it <laughs> if I look at, uh, if I just look at uh, Janet Yellen and uh, Christine Lagarde, um, uh, their most recent statements on Bitcoin, it seems that they're still in the fear phase for Bitcoin. So, so I'm not, I'm not sure, perhaps on a technical level somewhere, some people will say, well, <laughs> at least Bitcoin is more transparent than the other one. So, Let's let's have them play with that rather than move to to more uh, intransparent forms. That that might be possible on a technical level, but I think in the in the minds of some of the uh, policymakers internationally, um, the fact that you you can be your own boss, you can take control, you can just hold your own wallets and your own keys uh, and transact with other people out of sight. Yeah, that's sort of like what what Lagarde calls this is the escape route. And then they call in the, the firemen from the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, to close the escape routes. Well, if you know anything about fires and escape routes, there's one thing you shouldn't do. You shouldn't block the escape routes. At some point in time, you will need them. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'm afraid they're, uh, they're still, they're still way too scared and, and not really attentive to what's happening in the Bitcoin space because, because another argument could be that the Bitcoin space will develop towards more um, uh, privacy-minded uh, structure by itself. So, yeah, 
Uh, it's hard to predict, certainly on a global level where regulators were, uh, what their minds are, but uh, they don't seem to be accepting the reality of the open source network. Uh, that's that's for sure. Do you want to talk a, bit, a little bit more about that? What look, uh, her, the comments that she made? I mean, she basically was calling for strong regulation of, of Bitcoin, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so what Lagarde said. Um, so I listened to it. Um, Basically, from from a bit of my work in the past was like writing speeches for central bank governors, and then you have these briefing moments, and then you basically have a uh, fifteen minutes, and you can brief your governor. Okay, here is your speech, and this is what you're going to say, and then he'll ask some questions, and, and so so he'll get a grip on on the subject, like oh okay yeah yeah so so you try to tell as clear as possible this is this is the thing. So if you listen to Christine Lagarde, you can listen literally, but I was listening like okay. She has been briefed for 50 minutes by some people in a room. Um, now, what are the words that she's choosing? What are the key words that she uses right now? And what have they been trying to put in her head? So, so they've been the, the, the escape route was one thing that they put in her head because it came out pretty quickly. The we need regulation was a thing that came out, and the FATF was was a thing that came out. So, so I imagine she had 20 minutes with her briefers and they sort of said, yeah, yeah, we, we gotta be careful. We need to regulate. We need to, we need to close the escape routes and, and the FATF is gonna do it for us. So in my view, that's, and that's why please send that message because we gotta do more at the FATF level. So support, please mention the FATF so that it gets your support, uh, uh because of your statement. Um, that, that's how, how I imagined what happened before she was saying those words, uh, and for that reason, I figured, okay, if because you could you could say all kinds of things about regulation of, of of Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency, you could talk about stable coins, about you could talk about the central bank digital currency, but she chose to talk talk about escape routes and FATF. Well, that's funny. So if if from those subjects, that's the one she chooses. It tells me that that the FATF is where they're moving. To, um, and you see there's an interim report of the Financial Action Task Force uh, that says, well, we can imagine that uh, governments take uh, address some risks proactively. Well, that's sort of a lingo for uh, if you feel like regulating stuff to hell, go ahead. <laughs> You're addressing the risks forward looking. Uh, I mean, that's sort of like giving a license to, to just mess about and try some regulation out. And I think uh, the, the whole... Um, that's that's part of a larger picture where um, the FATF hasn't come to terms with the new technology, is trying to basically uh, mold, use the banking mold and push it onto crypto. Um, and and they have a hard time doing that because the technology doesn't doesn't work that good or is, is different than the regular banking account system. And that's, that's a tricky thing. And um, still they are going to push forward. That's basically the message. So that was that's sort of my takeaway from her talk was like, hmm, yeah, there, there, there are too many indications that are going to push forward. And if I look at what happened in the Netherlands, if I look at the FinCEN proposal, which is very similar, but slightly better with uh, some thresholds, uh, sort of like all arrows are into the direction of let's criminalize the, the self-hosted wallet and the peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms and make sure that it's going to be outlawed or made so complex that people will want to have uh, wallets in custody somewhere. And then you end up basically with, with pushing crypto towards the classic banking model. And then the FATF can relax and lay back and say, okay, yeah, we, we, we've done it. Now the crypto is just like banks. They're sending the private information of customers to each other for all Bitcoin transactions. And then they basically, you, do, you create a wedge where there's the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, which is in custody everywhere. And then the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin blockchain. Even you can even ask yourself the question: Will there be two, one single technological Bitcoin, but perhaps two, um, two rates? Like the, you have the the formal and the informal exchange rates of of currencies in countries which have a strong regulation. Like in Poland, I used to I, I went there for a vacation many many years ago. You 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 had like the formal exchange rate of the slotty, and then you would come to someone in the street that hey hey you wanna exchange money, and then you. Get a much better rate, and you get some illegal uh, funds. So, um, my my fear is that we're moving towards a a uh, hosted and unhosted world in crypto, 
uh, with real separation there and a criminalization of the unhosted world. Do you think this could push potentially push people towards uh, cryptocurrencies like Monero uh, as uh, they realize? Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. And, being co-opted. Uh, yes, and and the good thing about technology is, is I mean, yeah, the, the 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 ghost is out of the bottle. You, I mean, you, you can't uninvent these technologies. Anyone can just build it and use the open source. Uh, knowledge and and set it up for his own purposes or his or a group where 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 you want to achieve things. So yeah, it's it's very hard to to undo this, but but of course you can criminalize it and make it so complex that it becomes a very niche uh, thing. But the, but the good thing is that the technology is there; it's not going to go away ever. All right, you have you have any other? Thoughts? I mean, what, uh, given that you've been in this for so long, I mean, how, how you feeling about it today? Looking at where we're at in terms of uh, the growth of Bitcoin, its its current price, um, regulations, these comments that we're seeing from Lagarde. What's what's your overall take on the current status of cryptocurrency? Um, well, speaking mainly about, I guess. Bitcoin right now, um, it is pretty clear that is it is already an asset class in its own right. I mean, it's uh, if if you have too much money, it's just smart to invest a bit of it into Bitcoin. You don't care if you lose it, and it's a huge, great hedge against uh, the stuff that may occur. And 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 you can become even more filthy rich than you are already. I mean, this is exactly what you're seeing happening in my view uh, at, at the moment. Um, uh, and that creates a um, countervailing power also for governments. Uh, they're not going to banish Bitcoin anymore completely because there's too many rich people already in there uh, who are going to phone up their, their their senators and say, hey, what are you doing, guy? You shouldn't do this. This is this is not smart. This is my money you're toying with. So uh, stay off. So so I think in that sense, it's a done deal. It's It's here to stay as an asset class. Uh, there's going to be a lot of discussions about the, the forms of asset class. There's a huge, huge future discussion. Of course, the, the SEC has been um, rounding up all the, the ICO uh, issuances and all the, the basically the security issuances, the, the, the crypto variations that were effectively a share. Um, but, but technologically, there's a very uh, open space, a huge open space uh, in the tokenization area because you can basically split up and tokenize all kinds of assets. And the, the big mistake that we would make or that we could make is uh, that if I tokenize my house into, into 10 little bits and I sell off my house uh, and then pay my rent into the tokenized bits of the, uh, of the house, there are many variations possible. And are we going to say for all those tokens that they are financial instruments? And that they are like money, and then we have to apply the FATF framework. That would be silly. But we are going to tokenize the, all the world around us. My bicycle, my car. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to share in a sharing economy. I can do all kinds of stuff. And we we haven't solved that thing yet. And I I hope we will we will be smart enough to distinguish between uh, classic financial instruments and financial transactions and uh, other goods transactions. And not say that the other goods, because they are done by a technology that looks like financial transaction technology, then by definition are also financial transactions. Because then we basically create, then we say that each transaction in the world is a financial transaction. And that's, it's not true. It's silly. And, and you should spend your ideas on regulation, basically focusing on the important spots. So, so, uh, Bitcoin is here. It's here to stay as an asset class. Tokenization is a way open area with lots, uh, lots of things to happen. Um, and what I would hope is that we have a, um, uh, a realization, um, that the, uh, that we end the broadcasting view on, uh, data surveillance. So the old framework where 20 years ago, it was smart to say, well, we're going to put all the data in banking transactions because we don't have any other way of getting data around the globe and, and having it easily available. Well, right now, you have lots of ways to get information. No need to put private information in banking transactions or in crypto transactions anymore. You can get it everywhere else. So we should stop the charade, the, the useless uh, filing of transaction reports, suspicious transaction reports. Stop it. 
you you spend you'll you'll save a lot of a lot of money. Um, it's a huge privacy invasion, and I would hope that uh, that you can already see human rights courts, the Court of Justice in Europe, saying Facebook can't export its data to uh, European data to the US. Uh, I would I would think the European flavor in the game uh, would be that we value privacy. There's a recent statement of our data protection authority in Europe that says, "Hey guys, listen up, all you all you uh, money launderer uh, um, uh, uh, officials." Listen to us. Here's the Court of Justice. Here's the human rights. How can you go on data surveilling if this is basically an intrusion of privacy and the presumption of being innocent until guilty rather than being guilty until innocent? The only reason you could send data to, to a police official is if you think he's guilty or, or, or something. You can't, you can't send innocent people data to the police because it's suspicious. Why? I'm not a police officer. How is it suspicious? Because I, I, because my threshold of a payment is beyond the three thousand euro. I'm suspicious. How's that? It fails completely. Fails the, the the test under privacy laws and under human rights laws. And I hope I would hope that the European flavor in the game would be that we 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 put in a couple of uh, um, how do you call these uh, stakes into the heart of this money laundering cult and basically eliminate this broadcasting of data all over the world because that's a really stupid idea certainly in this time and age of big data where once you, you've broadcasted it and there there's only needs to be one one person in the chain leaking it and you're gone so so we need to reverse we need to reverse the uh systems in the world into pull requests you have a badge you can do a pull request specific data for one person because he's suspicious um, by means of a police officer, not by, by means of a tax authority person, but a police officer wants the data. Okay, he can get it one at a time, but not bulk data, throw it in a can and let them play around with it. That's that's old school. So I hope we'll, we'll cross that bridge at some point in time, but that's perhaps more hope than, than reality, but one needs to have a bit of hope here, I guess. Well, you know, this is the Monero talk show. I got, I got to push you a little bit more here just on Monero itself or, or call it what you right. want if, if you don't like picking out particular coins. But you're obviously, we, we spoke about it, I feel like already to nauseum, this fact that, you know, Bitcoin ha has lacked some of these characteristics, yet you, you seem apprehensive to talk about the need for people to adopt privacy coins do, do you think maybe that's the way forward is just being uh more vocal about that getting people to use something like monero versus bitcoin rather than hoping that governments uh don't over regulate bitcoin or don't start uh implementing these requirements that erode away at, at individuals privacy but get people to use something that preserves their privacy uh, in the technology itself. Uh, I, I got to push you on that. Don't, don't oh, you yeah. think? Would... Yeah, yeah, well, I think, I think you have your destiny in your own hand and uh, using Monero is the better way out if you want to start protecting yourself right now. I mean, you can sit around, it, exactly as you say, you can sit around and wait for the government to in intervene and, and hope that it stops, but you can take control yourself and, and, and shield yourself by using the proper tools and using uh, proper currencies like Monero to, uh, to make sure, uh, well, at least as far as you can influence it, uh, you, you s set up the walls around your own um, uh, life. So, so I'm fully with you on that. So it's, it's up to people to make that choice. And, yeah. you know, you 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 were skeptical of Bitcoin in the beginning. Uh, you you seem to be enthused by the fact that now it's it's kind of gained this this network effect and crossed the chasm, so to speak, and it's here to stay. Do you think it's it's the fact that it lacks fungibility and that it has the you know that it that it is on this transparent le ledger? Do you think that? That's a flaw at all. That that could potentially uh, be a, f a critical flaw to Bitcoin. Or you see, you seem to uh, be on the side of well, Bitcoin will will prevail, and it's it will adapt as needed. Uh, a, a lot of people in the Monero community are on the side of Bitcoin was a great first attempt, but uh, it's it's fundamentally flawed because it doesn't have fungibility built into its protocol. 
Where do you stand on that? You've been looking at this stuff for so long. Do you think that that's essential? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it's super essential. So uh, the um, uh, the European Central Bank is going to be issuing a uh, central bank digital currency. Uh, and they did a, a consultation round. So you could send in uh, your your opinions. So the only thing I said to them, create a stupid, dumb euro that is unable to do anything. It's digital, it's dumb, and it's anonymous. And that's my only response. So for each answer, each question I answered, make it as dumb as you can. Make sure people can use it. Make sure you can't track it. You can't uh, tweak it. That's what we need to do. That's what society really needs. So that that's that's um, that's that's where I stand. And um, because the importance of having this type of currency around in the future, that's the important. The, the, the alternative is that we get a that that will use a Facebook coin, and we are being sucked into the Facebook universe, or or a a Chinese uh, digital bank's uh, central bank digital currency, which is for for their purposes very convenient and handy, or a central bank digital currency, which is also very handy because you need to have a robust structure where where no one can can see and do stuff. That's that's where I stand, and that's. Uh, that's still perhaps a bit of a dreamer, but that's really what's what's needed. And in that sense, uh, if you would use that test, um, uh, Bitcoin wouldn't come up as highest. That's 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 pretty clear. And do you think the market will start to realize that, or people are okay with the fact that it it has this flaw and it will just be adopted as is? Uh, yeah, well. The, 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 the problem with the privacy debate is, is basically it's hugely important. Um, and I can be very adamant about it, like, well, this is important. We need to guard it and, and we'll look out, look out. But in reality, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's still, who cares? I mean, the, the, the if I, if I go shopping in, in a shopping mall, uh, I may find one person <laughs> sympathizing and the other ones, they don't care. They throw out their personal data everywhere. They really, they're littering all the, all the world with, with, with not caring about their personal data. So, so yeah, I, I'm. But how about on, on a <laughs> on a technological yeah. level, right? I mean, isn't uh, the the better protocol the one where every unit equals every other unit? I mean, you've been studying money for 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 quite a long time. Uh, isn't that a fundamental property? Um, no, but that's a very complex other debate. The the complex of what is money because we're used to thinking about money. Uh, in forms that we know right now, like the, the uh, euro as a unit of account and the payment mechanism and the tool. But if you go back in Amsterdam history, uh, you would have the Flemish pound. And the Flemish pound wasn't in existence. It was a unit of account translated into one of the many coins circulating in, in the area, in the, in the economy. Um, so there are, are many ways and, and uh, mechanisms for making payments uh, without needing a one-on-one -on -one reserve function, um, uh, but that, uh, as our, yeah, that that's really a different, very philosophical debate on the essence of money. Um, uh, um, uh, and and if you if you would try, it's it's about if I if if I would summarize it, uh, money is uh, is is uh, you have sort of token and ledgers. If you look at money, it's either somewhere in a bank or it's in your hands. Uh, and you can compare those token and ledgers, uh, because those are already financial in nature. But if you take, if you look at money, it's money is by definition a social construct. So if we are interacting as people, we interact in a many variety of ways with a huge number of, let's say, uh, features or, or variables or sensitivities. And money in essence is like a financial segment of a full human relationship. So it's a very simple technology being used to do some economic stuff, but it's also always within uh, a framework of social relationships. And given that that is the, the situation, the, 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 there's a discussion about primitive money, which is uh, sort of uh, old forms of money, like ritual money that you give to, in a ritual, you give some people money in some form. Uh, and then the economists say, no, that's not true money. It's primitive money, it doesn't count. They only find money, the economic parts of money, when it comes close to what we know now as money. Um, so if you look at money very fundamentally, um, 
I think uh, we need to start out with the concept that money by definition is the simplified human ledger. It's a distilled bit of human ledger and the human ledger is between you and everyone else. And we have taken this part of the human interaction. We've standardized it into coins, into notes, into all kinds of currencies and stuff. But that's only a part of the of the human relation, and it's it's possible wider forms are are much wider, and and there could be also all different forms of uh, reputation money, uh, where it's it's not at all about one on one conversion. There are many other features. It's uh, that there's there's in Canada in uh, in 1672 they used playing cards for money. Uh, an officer in, in, in an army, they, they, the ship with money was coming in, but it was still on the sea and he had to pay out the soldiers. And he took a deck of cards and another deck and another deck. He put denominations on its signature and the system worked for, for about 50 years until the French took it out of circulation. We have so many varieties in money in so many ways we can be so more creative. Uh, so, so that, that's where, that's where you, where I end up. Like well, our most of our money debates are are already very cornered and centered into one form. It's 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 terribly more complex, and I'm certain I I'm I'm not summarizing it properly. If financial history professors are looking to this, but uh, but my feeling Wait. is it's very broader subject than just the economic side. Right, right, right. But I'm sure you you would say that you know money, good money is fungible, where every unit equals every other unit. No, well, um, what I would say, if, if you ask me what's good money, I would say good money is money which uh, tells you where it comes from and where it's going, which has an inherent value feature. So, so that you can, so that you know that your money is, uh, I would say good money would be money that, uh, if you, if I take away the privacy part, but, but that's very important, but money is often used as a sort of indifferential unit. But it's not indifferential. We're burning up the planet. We need to create monies like like you have uh, this coffee that I'm buying. If I buy this coffee, I'm helping a poor farmer create a living. And if I buy this one, I'm helping a multinational. In that sense, you can look at money and say, well, if I use this form of money, I'm sure this will happen in the value chain beyond this current transaction. And if 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 you look at good money, that that would to me that would be money that has some of the features that help out uh towards solving some of the resource problems that we have on the planet like like how, how we're gonna have clean water and and try and avoid pollution as much as possible hmm. okay all right well we we uh we ran the gamut here <laughs> i guess i'm sorry sorry about that <laughs> no this is great push, that's, push that's that. <laughs> i was just trying to i was trying to push you on on you know what I know. what i yeah. see as being the, the core elements of money yeah. and you know fungibility being one of them, you know, you know, one, one atom of gold equals one atom, one US dollar equals one US dollar, one Bitcoin should always equal one Bitcoin. But we know that's not the case because it's on this transparent ledger where all transactions are, are, can be tracked and traced uh, and marked as needed. And I don't see how that is the most efficient form of money that we could have when we could have a version of something like that, but without the ability to, to mark money, making, you know, certain units diff uh, different than other units. As simple as that. And I, I just wanted to, to, to poke you on that because I know you've been looking at money for a long time and uh it's it's my belief that that's a fundamental requirement for for good money and if we have the technology to do that 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 technology that version of money will be the best form well the good thing about money is that that it uh it can coexist with other forms so the best can survive that's i think that's that's the important thing is that that we create space for each form to be possible rather than uh, dominate or kick out stuff that we don't like. I think that's, that's, mm -hmm. I, I would agree. Certainly. I mean, there's, uh, <laughs> there's the, I, I see where you're driving at and I'm, I'm not sure, of course not. So, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm with you, but I, I do seriously believe that, that, um, 
by allowing all kinds of forms and features of money, we, we do the best for society. Um, and then and then we can see in practice um, what turns out to be the best way forward. And that could be that could well be your your approach. So right and the the market will decide you know, yeah. the money the monies will compete against each other and they'll be used in, in different it, ways yeah it's a bit if, if you look at the old uh, we had the bank of amsterdam a very old sort of a central bank in amsterdam uh and and the the transactions it did were influencing the money supply uh, uh in europe and the netherlands uh and and if if economists from right now look at those days then they say well how did they do that and how could they no, they were basically doing monetary policy without knowing the monetary policy uh, equations. They didn't have the books of Keynes and all those guys. And how could they do it? Uh, I mean, we could be in a similar situation right now with cryptocurrency, where uh, in 100 years time, we look back and say, well, how did they do it? They didn't know exactly what the important features was. They were moving forward, experimenting, finding out on the way um, uh, what happened. That, that might well be the case because we're learning every every time. And, and the answer in, in the... In the old days in Amsterdam was basically uh, the people were trading carefully, looking what happened in the market and responding to what happened and being very cautious. That's sort of if, if yeah, that's sort of the way you yeah you, you'll find out, you'll notice, and then you figure out hey, oh, what's happening with the prices. The prices go up. Could it have to do with something with that? What happens if we lower the prices? So being very careful in an environment where where you're where you have some sense of a, or a working model, uh, but perhaps not not all the intelligence that you would have after 400 years of study. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, uh, so I'm, I'm curious to know how we will look back on this, uh, this time and age if, uh, if we're a hundred years older. Yep. All right, Simon, greatly appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to uh, following you on Twitter, seeing your tweets. Where else can people uh, continue to follow you and learn more about you and the, and the, the work that you're doing? Uh, I think if they just hit the um, uh, the the Twitter uh, uh, feed, then then they'll be there. Uh, it links to my uh, web page as well, and there's a, a bunch of blogs. So um, I'm I think the entry point would be the Twitter feed. All right, we'll add your your Twitter to our show notes. Yeah, and your, your website as well. All right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank you, thank sir. You thanks so much. For, yeah. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate okay. it. Cheers. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.